Welcome to the final lecture of Introduction to Linguistics. Today we'll talk about rules in phonology. So let's get right into it. What is the purpose of rules? Well, we want to formally explain how these phonological changes occur. So for instance, we have these underlying phonemes and the word can, but we do some rules and then we get to this surface form where the K is aspirated the a eh is a little bit nasalized, and that n looks like an h, so let's fix that. So, we have these rules, and we need to order them in a way that when we take words and we get to the surface form, the rules interact properly and we don't get anything weird. So for instance, uh, let's take a look at this flow chart. First we have the underlying word can. Uh, the first rule is going to be to aspirate it. So we're going to aspirate this k. So this becomes an aspirated K with this a eh and this n. And the second step is going to be to nasalize the vowel because it's before an n. So we take this aspirated K, we nasalize the ash here, and we have n. So our surface form is can. And it goes through this little black box where we put in an input, it pops out an output and we have this formalized change. Okay, so that's the rough guide to how this thing works. So how do we talk about rules? Well, first of all, we have some thoughts here. Rule order may matter. So here, if I did nasalization first and aspiration later, wouldn't make a difference. However, when we work with stress and schwas, we need to put stress on before we take vowels and make them schwas. Otherwise, everything will have schwas, and if we put stress on later, you can't have a stress schwa. So we need to make sure our rules are ordered properly. And the second part is that maybe these rules that we're constructing, maybe that's not how speech works. Maybe we don't take the word and then we first nasalize it, and then we first and then we aspirate it. Um, Maybe we want them to be aspirated in every case, and then we just change it to non-aspirated. Who knows? Who knows how we do things? So, those are some thoughts on rules. But, even though we have these thoughts and we say, hey, maybe these rules aren't how things work, um, we're going to teach it anyway, because it's in every textbook, and it's good to think a little bit differently. So, here's how we write rules. This looks weird, right? We have an A, we have an arrow, we have a B, we have a slash, we have an X, we have an underscore, and we have a Y. What does this mean? So the first part here says, that was a terrible thing. This means A turns to B, or A becomes B. Let's write that. Okay, so A becomes B. What does the slash mean in the environment? So basically this means A goes to B, and then we take a look at the environment. So, first thing is this underscore. This is, um, this is the sound you're looking at. So, to make this clear, if I'm talking about nasalization, I would put the A ah here. So if I'm talking about A um, ah going to this nasalized A, eh, then I'm looking at the a uh, in this underscore. Uh, the two locations are going to be before and after the sound we're looking at. So for instance, um, let's do this more for, uh, informally here. So we have a uh, goes to nasalized a uh, in the environment of, well, it doesn't matter what's before it, so we don't put anything. Um, we put the a uh, we're looking at, and this happens before n. So what this means is that a uh, becomes nasalized before n. So that is the description of how formal rules work. And this is a very, very informal way of writing it. So normally we don't just use sounds here, because there might be more sounds for which this works. And we want to encompass all the things that change in one rule. So for instance, nasalization should not be one rule about a, eh, and it should not be before n. It should be about all vowels before nasals. So, how do we do these things? Well, 
we use features. So for instance, whatever vowel we have adds the property of nasalization before nasal consonants. That's what this one is saying. So we take the vowel, for instance, we take A, and it becomes this nasalized A. So for instance, we add this property of nasalization to it. And what this says is before these consonant nasals, these nasal consonants. So this set of features talks about N, mm, talks about N, mm, and talks about N. Mm. So for instance, in the word pain, it's saying that, look, that's nasalized. That A is nasalized, so it's pain. You got that A sound instead of A, it's A. So this is the nasalization rule. So again, let's just go over this quick again, um, just to really drill this in, because this is the first time you're probably seeing this kind of thing. We take a vowel. Um, I know you're saying, hold, hold, hold on a second. You said, you said we need to be general. Why are you writing vowel here when you should use features? Um, it's pretty common just to write a V because we know it means vowel. C means consonant. Oh, we're just being really general here. We're saying any vowels, but we could just write um, minus cons plus sil plus sonorant. And that would be the same thing. So this adds the nasal property before nasal consonants. Okay, so that's nasalization. What about aspiration? So remember how we took this k and this became a k when there was um, a stress and onset? Okay, so we have this thing here and we have this chart. So this chart, this thing, this chart of sounds, this feature matrix. And this feature matrix says plus consonant, minus continuant, minus voice, minus delayed release. These are the four features necessary to target T, P, and K. So, so you might be thinking, hold on a second, how did you come up with this? How did you come up with these four features? Well, first of all, these are the targets. So I look at this and I say, what features do I need? I need plus consonants for sure. Okay, so that's important. But then I have S and F and th in it, and I don't want those. So I have to take out the continuance sounds. But now I have b and g and j and uh, d. I don't want those, so I have to take out the voice sounds because I don't want those. Um, delayed release. So now normally I'd say, okay, hold on, I'm done here. But wait a second, there's more. There's ch. Ch is not voiced. Ch is not continuous. Ch is a consonant. But what feature makes it different from every other sound? Delayed release. And that has delayed release. So we want the ones that aren't delayed release. And then we end up with this T, P, and K. Okay, so that's the target. And this becomes aspirated. So what is the aspiration feature? Aspiration is the spread glottis. So when we want to aspirate something, we spread our glottis. So this gets the plus spread glottis feature. And then we use in the environment of, well, this is after, this is after something. And I'm using this weird thing here and I'm saying, hold on a second. You have a syllable here and you have this word stress here. Can, can I do that? And the answer is, mm, well, no, but yes, it's okay. Because really the condition is saying, look, when you have primary stress on a syllable, the T, P, or K becomes aspirated. So this is how we write it. We use the syllable all the time. So really what I'd say is syllable and maybe plus stress. So we just make that a feature because we do have to denote it somehow. So you could do that or you could subscript it. The important part is that you know and you're explaining where the environment occurs. So plus stress and it's right after the stress syllable. And of course, um, you may be thinking, hold on a second. This is the syllable. So it's after a syllable. Um, so there's another convention I should probably mention. If it's here, the syllable, this usually means in the onset. If it's here, it usually means in the coda. So um, if it's between both, it usually means the nucleus. So these are things um, you kind of have to use your judgment on. 
There's no formal features for this, but this is commonly used in rules. Definitely check with your professor before you submit something with a syllable on it. Um, but this is a good way of writing stress. So aspiration, um, this is the rule. Again, we use these four features to target the T, P, and K. We change it to the aspirated um, T, K, and P with spread glottis. And this occurs after primary stressed syllables. So this was the same example we used in the previous video. So hopefully you've understood the aspiration by now. So I'll give you a task. It's a very special task. Um, you have to look at these phonemes to allophone variations and you have to come up with two rules that explains the change here. So you can pause the video and try your best um, and then you can unpause it now and I'll tell you how to do this. Okay, first of all, what are we looking at? This ng goes to m, np goes to m, nd, nt, m, nk, nsh, nf. Okay, so what do we see here? It all starts off as an n. Everything is n. But then depending on what is beside it, it changes. So when it's beside a g, it becomes an n. So what is g? G is voiced velar and m is a velar nasal. So maybe this velar property, maybe the fact that it's in the back of the mouth affects what's happening to m. What about this m here? M and then a p. A p is bilabial and so is this m. So maybe the place of articulation is affecting the m. Let's take a look and verify it. The d is an alveolar, does not affect the alveolar. T is alveolar. The b here is a bilabial, and that changes the n to an m. The k is a velar, that changes the n to an m. Sh is palatal, doesn't do anything. F is almost bilabial, it's um, labiodental. So yeah, that, uh, that changes it to a bilabial m. So we're going to say that the place of articulation affects the mm. Okay, so that's the general idea here. So let's write some rules. And the first way we do rules is we kind of look at it informally. And we say, okay, what's happening informally? Well, this mm becomes an mm, and this is before, um, we want to say bilabials, but are there any features? Well, we do know one feature. It's the labial feature. So it's before lab, it becomes an m. What about this n? Well, this is different because it's just before dorsal. So this last one here, this n, I leave it here because we could write something like before core, but we can see this is the same sound to begin with. So do we really need this description? No, because we're not making a rule that changes n to n. N is always n. So we just say this n occurs elsewhere. And we make rules to change n to the other two sounds instead. Why? Because n doesn't go to n in very many um, environments. And n doesn't go to n in very many environments. It is most commonly n, so because n is most common, we don't want to write it a rule for that. We just want to say, okay, that's the default. So that's the informal analysis. Let's do some rules. So how do you target n as a sound? Say it's coronal and it's plus nasal. That distinguishes n from everything else. Because English only has three nasals. It has m, n, there's the m, n, the n, n, and the ang, n. So it's really either coronal, dorsal, or labial. Okay, so let's write the change from N to M. The coronal plus nasal, it loses its coronal and just becomes a labial. So you could write just lab, you could write minus core as well. Um, it's not easy to have a coronal labial sound, so you probably don't have to write this minus core, but just in case to illustrate a point, it loses its coronal and becomes a labial. And in what environment? 
This happens before labial sounds. So before labial, this n will become an m. Okay, what about n to the ang? Well, again, it just becomes dorsal and it loses its, loses its coronal. And this happens before dorsal sounds. Now, if we want to be more specific, we could say, okay, it's before um, dorsal consonants. And in fact, we should say it's before consonants because vowels are dorsal and it doesn't happen before all vowels. So specifying consonant is probably good. So these are the two rules. We're saying, hold on a second. Um, two rules for this one thing. This is this is assimilation. This is one process. Why do we have two rules? That's 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 a good question. Why do we need two rules for one process? It looks like they're exactly the same thing. It's just we're changing our place of articulation. Why don't we have a general place of articulation rule? So here's the question. Why can't we say that this becomes um, core? plus nasal. Actually, let's not even say that. Why can't we have it that this nasal becomes, I don't know, some place of articulation before um, the place of articulation? And we sort of have rules like this. We can cheat. We can say, okay, this is a variable. So we call this alpha. So this just means that this nasal becomes whatever place of articulation is in the environment of whatever that um, place of articulation is. So these are um, variables. And this on the right means it's the same variable. So as an example, if this is a labial, this becomes a labial. If this is a dorsal, this becomes a dorsal. So that's how the alpha works. Uh, most profs will not allow this in introduction to linguistics. Maybe in your intro phonology course you'll talk about this, but um, this is generally, um, generally, I wouldn't say bad, generally not welcome. So I'd highly suggest not using this rule. But the question, why doesn't this exist, is very, very good. It's a very important question. And I will answer that by saying you should look at feature geometry and optimality theory. These are above what this course has taught. These are way above this course. But this addresses those questions. Um, feature geometry says, okay, look, we have these featured trees, and sometimes you have this sound, like say this n and this g, and it has this plus coronal property, and what it does is it spreads to this feature, and suddenly this becomes an n. So we get this kind of spreading here. That's what feature geometry says. And optimality theory is a little bit different. Instead of having feature trees, we have something that says, okay, well, when we had this n and this g, um, we don't want um, a change in a place of articulation with nasals. And we call these constraints. We say, look, we want to avoid this at all costs. So what it does is, because we're avoiding this change, um, this just becomes the same place of articulation. So these are two different approaches to phonological rules. And of course, there are more, but those are the two big ones that I'll explain. So you'll encounter those later in phonology. I might introduce them at some point, but um, these are two different ways of looking at it. So that's it. Introduction to Linguistics, the course is now complete. Um, there are exams at trevtutor.com in the linguistics section. You can go down to Introduction to Linguistics. Scroll down to the bottom, there are exams. Um, I may do videos covering them at some point. Um, but for now, congratulations, you completed the course if you watched all the videos. Um, that is Analytic Linguistics. Of course, there's Social Linguistics, Historical Linguistics, First Language Acquisition, Second Language Acquisition. Um, there's all that kind of stuff. but. Uh, they're not covered in this course, and I don't really intend to, to cover those, so uh, for those of you who want it, I'm sorry, but you will not see those here. So, I uh, hope you, see you, you enjoyed the series. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Share and like the video if you enjoyed it, and uh, hopefully I'll see you for mathematical linguistics in the future.